Good afternoon. Welcome to our today's business event, Austria and Catalonia, international trade and investment locations exchanging ideas to face a successful post-COVID-19 future. My name is Christina Schreiber. I'm the delegate of the government of Catalonia to Central Europe. And for, as an introduction, very quickly, the last months, uh, as all of us know, have not been easy for most economies around Europe and in many countries worldwide. As there was a presentation of the government of Catalonia, an economically and culturally important southern European location, we give support to the different sectors of our society that form part of the international activities of Catalonia and its projection as a strong and reliable partner. For centuries, Catalonia has directed its activities towards Europe and the Mediterranean. To engage European collaboration, it was the first autonomous region that opened an office in Brussels when Spain became part of the European Union in 1986. And Catalonia has always played a very proactive part in international cooperation and the European construction. In the economic sector, it is one of the leading players of the Spanish economy, not only regarding exports, as our panelists will explain you later on. And following this tradition, our economic interactions with other European or international partners are aimed to lead to longer lasting collaborations with other European or international partners. And they're aimed to help uh, economies and citizens, not only in Catalonia, but around the globe. And it helps us work towards a common and much more sustainable future. Therefore, we are very happy and proud to be, talk to be able to talk today with renowned institutions from Austria and Catalonia, such as the Vienna Business Agency, the Austria Investment Agency, the Barcelona City Council, and the Barcelona Chamber of Commerce, as well as stakeholders from the private industry specialized in the finance sector and sustainable mobility. The idea is to give you an overview of the different business opportunities in both locations and the services local institutions can offer you and to debate among stakeholders first and experiences on how they are adapting to the current situation successfully as entrepreneurs or even from a social entrepreneur's point of view. What changes are taking place and what chances can they offer? And now to make this rather long online conference uh, as easy as possible for you, uh, we have divided the event in three parts, which will be introduced separately. I will lead you through the first two parts, which are dedicated to the investment and business locations, Vienna and Barcelona in the first part, and Austria and Catalonia in the second part. Linda Suski, Austrian journalist, she will lead us through the stakeholders debate. And uh, you can see also the program uh, at the bottom, at the description of the YouTube channel. And you can also write us your questions at the end of every part. We're going to have a round of questions and answer through the live chat function on the YouTube channel. So also please be patient with us. Um, if something does not go perfectly well technically wise, uh, we're still adapting our activities to the online format. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And let's get, let's get to business. So I am welcoming our first panelists of today, Ms. Ute Stadelbauer from the Vienna Business Agency and Mario Rubert from the Barcelona City Council. Welcome, both of you. Um, I give you a short introduction to each one of the speakers. Ute Stadelbauer is a regional manager in Vienna Business Agency, managing foreign direct investments from North America, Latin America, the Caribbean, Portugal, and Spain. And formerly, Ms. Stelbauer worked as funding specialist, translator, and editor, marketing manager, gallery manager, head of marketing, head of corporate publishing, and senior commissioning editor and project management. Ms. Ute Stadelbauer beholds an MBA, general management, at the University of Donau Universitat Krems. And she will talk today about expanding to Vienna, introducing the VBA and its services. Uh, her presentation will be followed by Mr. Mario Roberts. Uh, talk. Mr. Roberts, the City Promotion Director of the Barcelona City Council. He was Deputy Director for Economic Promotion at the Barcelona City Council, responsible for Barcelona's international marketing and economic promotion strategies. And from 2003 to 2007, he was appointed Barcelona's Managing Director for Economic Promotion, with responsibilities that included the city's management of retail, 
and commerce, municipal markets, entrepreneurship and employment, tourism and international promotion. Since 2008, he coordinates actions aimed to attract foreign investment, manages the Barcelona brand and promotes business opportunities in the city. Before joining the public sector, Ms. Rupert worked as legal expert at the European Parliament and the European Commission. Mr. Rupert is graduated in law by University of Barcelona and holds a master's degree in public service management. 2005, he enjoyed the International Visitor Leadership Program offered by the US State Department. And Mr. Rupert will talk to us on Barcelona, a city for all lives venture. So I would suggest that now we start with this first part and we will start with the conference of Ms. Uta Stadelburger, Vienna Business Agency. from the Vienna Business Agency. I'm going to introduce you quickly um, the business location in Vienna and what the Vienna Business Agency does, what we are, and what we can offer. Um, so let's start with the first facts, what others say about Vienna. Um, it's uh, widely known that um, Vienna, now the 10th time in a row, um, um, ranks number one of quality of living the, in the global livability. A ranking number one, we won the Smart City Index, and we're supposed to be one of the best uh, startup cities. So apparently, um, people can enjoy a very good quality of life in Vienna. Um, what does it include? It includes um, pretty affordable living compared to other European capitals. Um, we have very good municipal infrastructure and a lot of public transport, very good um, um, public services, and um, large public gardens, squares, um, bike lanes, um, and there is heavy investment from the city side as well. So um, what's um, some, some, some figures about Vienna um, that are also pretty widely known. Um, we're not only the capital of Central Europe, um, but we're also pretty cosmopolitan. Um, a lot of people don't know, um, roughly one third of Vienna's inhabitants were born outside of Austria. We're one of the fastest growing um, capitals in the European Union and um, the GDP per capita is almost double um, to the average GDP of the European Union. Um, Vienna is home to roughly 40,000 companies with around 800,000 employees and it's also the largest university city in the German speaking area. Um, so we are not only in the center of Europe, but still in COVID-19 times, uh, we are um, um, pretty accessible. Um, the Vienna airport in a normal running times um, has around 200 flights, 190 flights um, to all over Europe. And you can get to the airport within 15 minutes from, from the Vienna Central Station. Um, the runs, Vienna after COVID uh, right now has kind of reopened, um, flights are, are running again and trains are running again, so it's, um, um, it's already pretty well reachable. Um, it's an international hub, it's the only UN headquarter within the European Union, but it's also home to around 25,000 diplomats, so um, a lot of international um, and policy making going on in Vienna. Um, of 15,000 diplomats, we have 32 international organizations. And um, in normal running um, years, we have around 4,000 conventions and congresses um, in the city um, because of, because, because of uh, the fact that it's home to uh, so many international organizations. We have uh, 14 international schools and a lot of international universities. So um, it's a very good, um, it's a good place for expats and for doing international business. 
Um, Vienna is known to a lot of people as the cultural, it's a very cultural city with a large cultural heritage. Um, what a lot of people don't know is that um, tourism um, makes only about um, 4% of the GDP of the city. Um, Vienna is a very digital city and hidden champions in many, many um, different industries. Um, it's um, home to around 6,000 ICT companies and um, the ICT revenue is four times higher than um, the revenue from tourism. So um, it's, um, it's, it's, a pretty big, it's a pretty big um, hidden champion in, in, in this section. And it's, um, ICT is also the fastest growing export sector in Austria, also in this time of COVID-19 right now. Um, Vienna is also pretty known uh, to be a life science center. Um, it's um, almost, almost every um, international company in life sciences and in pharma has a um, subsidy or um, um, some sort of entity in Vienna. We host around 550 international companies conducting research. Um, Vienna is a headquarter for R&D. Um, Bernger Ingeheim, for example, placed an investment in 2015 of 700 million euros and, and um, built the, one of the worldwide cancer research centers in Vienna. Um, why is that so? Because we have um, large university departments in life sciences, um, pharma, biotech, and biology. Around 35,000 students, um, international students, uh, engaged in these careers. And um, we built up a cluster um, and at the Vienna Biocenter, um, giving home to, to, um, to a lot of international um, bio corporations. And we also run, together with the federal um, 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 agencies, we run the LISA, the Life Science uh, Austria Cluster in Vienna. Um, it's an R&D and innovation hotspot. Um, the R&D in quotes in Vienna is um, significantly higher than the one in the EU. It's 3.66%. Uh, um, it's we we can count on roughly 2.9 billion euros of R&D investment each year, and um, it's very attractive because there is also a federal um, tax revenue on on, on R&D of 14%. Um, so this um, this uh, um, describes very well why why um, life sciences and pharma is um, so big in Vienna. Um, it's a talent hub as well. It's the largest university city in the in the German speaking areas. We have around uh, almost two hundred thousand students and um, nine public university and uh, five private universities. Last year in autumn, the CEU from uh, Budapest um, relocated to Vienna and opened its develop premises ourselves as well. And then we give consulting services to um, international and local, local corporations, companies, and all of these services are free of charge um, um, provided for the city of Vienna. So especially for international organizations and companies and experts, um, we have services here at the expert center. Um, we can provide detailed information on the business location of Vienna. We can link you up with the ecosystem, with the industries with lawyers and tax accountants. We can provide information about commercial tax and labor law, about work permits, about relocation of your staff, and also about financial grants, because not only the city of Vienna is issuing grants and, and, and fundings, but also um, on a federal level, there is a wide range, a wide range of fundings available to companies. And um, as we are very well connected in the city ecosystem, but also with private stakeholders and corporations, we can establish and facilitate a lot of contacts and networks that are very valuable um, uh, in the beginning of your, of your um, um, business operations in the city of Vienna. And of course, we can provide support with all real estate needs. Um, we have um, an expert center that's dedicated to the support of expats um, and um, can help you through all the bureaucratic um, 
um, um, um, well, um, procedures with authorities, um, getting work permits. We have recommendations for um, internet, like multilingual lawyers in all um, in all fields. We have um, we can support you with family matters. Schools, kindergartens can provide you with information. Can link you up with um, with um, everything that you need when you're in a in a in a in a foreign city and try to settle. And we host, we run a club that's called the Expert Club, where we um, host, um, we organize and host events for um, experts in Vienna. We visit um, Viennese um, corporations. Um, there is wine harvesting in, in, in vineyards. So there are a lot of activities linking up the international community in Vienna. Um, as I said, all of this um, is uh, free of charge. Um, we have, we're around 150 people at the Vienna Business Agency. Um, we're, um, we have um, um, specialists in funding and creative industry. Industries in Vienna and publish reports in the industries that are very helpful and valuable as well for, for um, new corporations trying to settle because they have listings of all companies that operate in the field of Vienna. We run business meetups um, and we, um, we run workshops for startups. Um, so it's a wide range of services that we organize um, for all kinds of businesses, from small entrepreneurs to, um, to local shops to large corporations. Um, what's our FDI, our international output in Vienna? Um, in the last year, we had um, or we have accompanied um, 266 international companies that incorporated in Vienna. Uh, we had roughly 730 million euros of triggered investments in this year and roughly 2,000 charts created. Um, we can see that, um, that um, also despite the COVID-19, we have a very, very lively um, 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 business life um, here in Vienna. But of course, it's also very challenging for us because everything, everything has been remote and people just simply cannot travel, and uh, we don't know what's going to um, what's going to um, um, come up after this crisis. Um, but we are um, we are very open for um, for new collaborations and and also for the exchange of knowledge. So that was um, a brief abstract and on our services and the business location Vienna and um, of course we can go into depth a lot more and um, I'm open for all your questions that you're having um, throughout this conference. Thank you. And I hope I was in time. <laughs> yeah. Well, you did really well, Ute. So thank you very much uh, for this really interesting uh, overview on, on the services and the business location uh, Vienna. Um, before I pass now the word to Mr. Robert, uh, just a short comment. It's possible that some of you um, have uh, see the whole thing slower, like have some delay. Uh, we're looking at it right now um, at the YouTube channel, so stick with us. Um, it stays interesting and the technical part we're taking care of. So um, let me pass the word now to Mr. Mario Rupert, and he will talk to us about Barcelona, a city for all lives ventures. Mr. Rupert, Thank you. Please, Thank you, Christine. You. Hello, Ute. I'm friends from Vienna and Barcelona. I will try to be as brief as Ute and in 15 minutes explain you a little bit of Barcelona. It's going to be easy because probably most of you know perfectly well and have visited Barcelona. You know we, that we are an old city, more than 2,000 of years of history, but don't worry, in 15 minutes, we don't have time to go through. But it's important to remember that Barcelona has not been always like this, a business and tourist city. Only 70 years ago, we were known as the Catalan Manchester. And today, we are one of the innovative capitals in Europe and a, start, uh, a startup hub also in Europe and one of the most important tourist destinations. And this has not been like this always. Barcelona suffered, as you know, a very important transformation in occasion of the Olympic Games in 1992. It allowed us to transform completely the city and change international perception. We were able to transform the city in 10 years that in other ways it would have taken us a century. So our economic skin and, uh, has been changing recently. 
things, I think Barcelona is a good mix of tangible and intangible assets. Let me resume some of them. I think the first, and this is similar to Vienna, this is an asset, is, is the dimension. I think Barcelona has a very good dimension. Uh, the administrative city is only 1.5 million inhabitants, but the metropolitan area that our economic strength is 4.2. But when you ask about Barcelona and, and tell people it's, it's, it's a big city, it's a small city, it's a global, I would say it's a global city with human scale. I think that it has the good things of a global city, for example, an airport that has more than 50 intercontinental flights, but it's also very near the city that I like the one of Vienna, not 16 minutes, 18 minutes to the center of the city. So that it gives up a little bit this big or small, no? It's also a walkable city. One third of the daily movements of the people are made by foot. We have more than 350 kilometers of bike lines. So it has a quite good dimension. I think another asset is, is location, no? Location, location, location. We are one of the gateways for Asian products and companies uh, in Europe. 50% of the traffic of our uh, port comes from Asia. And we are also one of a strategic partner for Latin America. You know that we share with Latin America the language, we share part of the history. And there, together with the United States, we are the main investors in the United States, in, in Latin America. So a gateway for Asia, strategic partner for Latin America, and we are reference in the Mediterranean. But location without connection uh, doesn't go too far. We have a very good airport until now. Uh, it will achieve the figure of 51 million, um, 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 51 million passengers this year with more than 50 intercontinental nonstop flights. That was very good. We have one of the best nets of high-speed train in, in Europe. We are it's still linking the, 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 the connection with, with France, but we hope that soon it will take less than four hours to go from Barcelona to Paris, that it will make an important thing. So location, connections, dimension, that's a first set of assets. I think also it's, it's, it's important to understand that Barcelona has a diversified economy. I, I like to say that we have an economy specialized in diversity. So we still have an important manufacturing sector. As I told you 70 years ago, we were known as a Catalan Manchester. So still here we have automotive, pharmaceutical, food, editorial. But at the same time, we have new booming sectors. The mobile and tech is growing very, very much in occasion where we, of the Mobile World Capital uh, Congress, the GSMA that we organize each year with more than 100,000 delegates. It has allowed to spore up a new sector related with telecom and mobile. We have also a life science sector that is growing very importantly, or for example, the startups. We, together with Vienna, Berlin, and London, we are the top cities with the startups. We have Barcelona Activa, that's the local development agency of Barcelona, that was born 30 years ago to fight against unemployment but also to foster entrepreneurship. Now it's very fashion to support entrepreneurship, but I, I, I try to remember 30 years ago, no, nobody gave a damn for entrepreneurship. So uh, our tradition and supporting entrepreneurship doesn't come three years ago, it comes 30 years ago. We have different incubators in the city. We have different acceleration programs. We have a lot of foundings from national companies here and international. We have, uh, we monitor from the public side more than 5,000 projects each year from our premises. So I think we have a little bit all the pipeline of the ecosystem. And this is because we have been working entrepreneurship since, since very long. We have also an urbanism that uh, is based in the mixture of uses. Today, cities are seen as the devil with, with, with the COVID a little bit. But uh, cities uh, normally had a, a, a good opportunity with density, with mixing up uses, mixing up people. Um, the urbanism that Barcelona has been able to develop until now allowed this mixing up together that fosters and helps innovation and the transmission of knowledge. The city has avoided to specialize the city to, in different territories and likes to put in each neighborhood 
all the different uses together. So in each neighborhood, you can live, you can work, you can find cultural promises, you can do everything at the same time. Also, I think that Barcelona has been a magnet for uh, foreign companies. At this moment, Catalonia has nearly 8,000 foreign companies registered. In Catalonia, we have more than 70% of all the Japanese investment in Spain and more than 50% of all the French and German and US investment in Spain. So uh, that's our figures that are very, 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 very good. And last year, the figures of foreign investment in Catalonia was 3,600,000 million. That's more or less the same rate at the last year. That I think it's not bad figures uh, at all, representing more or less 20% of all the foreign investment in Spain. So foreign investment, it's, 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 it's important for us. I would say that it's also important our brand. Uh, we have been building uh, our brand uh, recently together with the citizens and with other institutions and company. We've done a very important process of co-creation of the new Barcelona brand that it supported in some pillars and values that we have decided among all of us together. So I think we have a brand that has been building the community. And now that the community is very fair to go and present it abroad. One more thing I think I, I, I like, I, I titled the, the, this, this presentation as Barcelona, the city for uh, all time projects or all time ventures. Uh, what I mean with this is that as Vienna, we can offer very good quality of life. But do we understand quality of life as something more than some beach, uh, golf and ski? Quality of life uh, allowed us to attract and retain talent. Quality of life means security in the streets, means good medical coverage, means cultural uh, offer, means commercial uh, offer, means all these things together. Everybody agrees today that the big battle between cities and nations and regions and territories is the battle for the more scarce good that is talent. Those who win talent will bring the companies uh, after. And this is a battle that Barcelona is uh, undertaking very, very, very seriously. I think that we have a very good mix of tangible elements that allowed us to attract the most talented people. If, uh, um, if you compare also prices and you see the cost of doing business in Barcelona or London or in Paris, you see that the uh, cost of a square meter in Barcelona is 10 times or 15 times less than in London or seven times less than in Paris. So we still have good cost of doing business. We have good connections and we have a good quality of life. In Barcelona Activa, in the city promotion, to conclude, we do basically three things to help. We promote Barcelona abroad, and we try to bring to the city all kinds of activity that can generate uh, employment and, and, and generate wealth for the city. So we do a lot of promotion, very sectorial, in different parts of the world. We also help the projects like Axio does and together with Axio and the, and the government of Catalonia, we help the landing of these projects. We give them free support in order to make more operational uh, their, their, their decision. And finally, uh, we try to learn from Vienna and other examples because we've been doing this, but quite recently is all the support we will give to the Pro, uh, professional landing of the expat community. In Barcelona, we have 20% of people from abroad, and uh, we are trying to give a 360 degrees program to help the people that comes to Barcelona to give them information, help them with the procedures. Once they are here, help them in, in the integration of themselves in the working uh, scenario and to their families in, in the daily life of the city and help them to dynamize and integrate uh, to the city. So I think I, I would leave it here. It has been a really quick wrap up 
of the assets of Barcelona and what we can offer to them. But I think that Barcelona and Vienna have many things in common. Our tourism uh, uh, is, is, is more important for Barcelona than for Vienna. I was surprised in hearing that in Vienna was only 4% of the GDP. In Barcelona, it's 12, 13% of the GDP. But in many other things, we are quite similar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rupert. That was a very interesting um, discourse on Barcelona as business location and also entertaining and short. So thank you very much for this. Um, I have uh, two quick questions for you and um, then we will take a short break um, after this block just to make sure that everybody uh, can see the event um, in, in perfect uh, technical condition. So I have a first question for Ute. Um, which yes. epic, yes. Uh, do you already see um, like uh, the situation of uh, startups, young startups under COVID? Like have you registered changes there, special problems and what have been possibly answers from the Vienna Business Agency? Um. Well, um, yes, we have, of course, seen um, a few startups struggling because of the lack of capital and because they were in the very early stage. Um, but we can also see that the ecosystem is still very stable. Um, what we did at the VBA was we provided um, immediate COVID-19 help um, uh, in forms of funds. Um, we invested roughly, um, we are almost 8 million, 9 million euros in um, in supporting the companies to establish their, their home offices and um, to establish the infrastructure to be able to work uh, remotely. Um, so this is what happened in, in March and April. And then um, we followed um, another, um, another program um, that um, supported um, companies to, to sell their services and the product online. So this is what we do. This is what we did. All our other programs they kept on running. So um, these um, around 13 million euros we spent additionally to the running funding programs. Of course, um, also all the workshops, all the consultations that we're having, um, we just um, we just did them remotely online. Um, so this happened pretty quickly as well. And then we um, also established some um, um, bank loans and some other financial instruments from the city in order to help um, cope with the situation mm -hmm. and the lack of finance in, in, in these times. Um, so we could see that, of course, some businesses were struggling. Um, that was natural, but we still don't see, um, we still don't see the big... Um, big how do you say the big end coming so um we hope that um that we can also host events in in public um with the community um in um in fall um we, we already started to work on it um we um we actually we would have had our big startup festival in may this year we are now 20, uh, 20. Um, which is um, postponed it to 2021, and uh, it looks pretty promising that um, it's growing even bigger. So I'm pretty positive for that. And what I could see that in this entire COVID-19 situation, a lot of startups just um, found new um, business opportunity and new uh, markets and uh, developed new products um, according to the needs of the market and the shift of needs that happened uh, through COVID-19. So this was a pretty positive um, impact of the crisis. All right. So uh, thank you very much, Ute, for this uh, very uh, in-depth um, explanation. And I would just quickly ask uh, Mario, Mr. Robert, uh, basically the same, kind of maybe more looking into the future. I don't know how far this is even possible, but maybe uh, what are the changes right now that you're seeing in the startup market in Barcelona, which is uh, obviously one of the the most um, probably sensitive sector as well um, in, in this COVID situation and Catalonia also being affected uh, quite a lot more than Austria uh, by, the, by the COVID. I think that all this crisis has helped in a certain way to establish our more and more cooperation between all the ecosystem of startups. For example, that the, when the, 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 the Mobile World Congress was cancelled suddenly, uh, in 10 days, 
for less than 10 days in a week, the, the startup ecosystem was able to organize something that was called Barcelona Spirit, that was a completely new event organized by the startups. So this shows that at these moments in Barcelona, there's an ecosystem that collaborates among them, that they're not silos uh, with, with different uh, partners, that the, the ecosystem works as a whole. It's important also that the support of the public administrations of Barcelona Activa in the city council and the direction of the government of the Generalitat that has our own direction for startups are working together. And in the sense, we give coverage uh, to the startups. It is important also that the spaces that we have in Barcelona, we have, I don't remember how many incubators, but we have uh, public incubators from the public administra local administration who have three or four, but there are many other from the private sector or from other administrations have no problems of, of booking space. So at these moments, we have uh, all the community that, of course, is going to be suffering. But at the same time, I think that we uh, are not going to be suffering too much in that sense. The autonomous are suffering very much. All the sector related with tourism and with other sectors are suffering very, very, very much. But the entrepreneurs, I hope uh, they are able to, to, to surf a little bit this wage and be able to, to, to keep their businesses and then recover. Thank you very much, uh, Mario. So um, I would close uh, this first part. Um, I want to just tell people that right now we're going to make a very short break to see what's the technical problem, the live transmission. But I can assure you that the, the recording is working perfectly, perfectly well. So we will have all the presentation, everything perfectly well later on on YouTube for you to see. But right now we just want to make sure if it's a problem uh, with the channel or with internet connection because we have some delay. So um, we're asking for your patience. Hang in there. We're going to get back as soon as possible, and um, and to con and this is to be um, continued. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Red, and thank you very much, Ms. Stadelbauer, for your insights, for your fantastic presentation. To keep it short, to keep it to the point, and it was really interesting. And hopefully, we can um, get back back to this topic later on in in our discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you. So it's Hello and welcome back uh, to the second part of our business event today. Now uh, Austria and Catalonia are uh, in the focus of our attention as potential trade and investment locations. And I'm very pleased uh, to welcome Ms. Gerlinde Geileitner from the Austrian Business Agency and Ms. Elisabeth campuri Oms, the president of the Barcelona Chamber of Commerce. Uh, welcome, ladies, and thank you for participating today. I will give you a short introduction to each one of the speakers, and then I will, so to say, give them the, the floor. So, uh, Ms. Garleitner from Austrian Business Agency, she was born in Linz and has worked for the Austrian Business Agency ABA Invest in Austria since 2014 as director, her area of responsibility includes Southern Europe and since 2018 also the UK and Ireland. Due to her many years of experience in the tourism industry, she's a tourism expert within ABA. She studied international economics in Linz and Rome and worked from 2000 to 2014 in various marketing and management positions in international hotel groups, as well as in the management of a private operating company in Linz. And Ms. Garleitner, today she will give us insights on the strengths of the business location Austria, how to get started. 
Ms. Elizabeth Camprovians from the Barcelona Chamber of Commerce is a product manager and general director of bc.cat and bconloan.com, marketing and international business. Ms. Camprovi is president of the Barcelona Chamber of Commerce and she is also leading CAT 3040 project since May 2019 and the CAT 2530 since April 2020. And Ms. Camprovi, today she will present us information on Catalonia as a prosperous business location. So I would like to ask now Ms. Geileitner to take over and uh, give her a presentation on Austria as a as investment location. Yes, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks a lot to Christina and your team for the organization of this event. Um, as you already said, I'm working for the Austrian Business Agency. Uh, we are the foreign direct investment promotion agency and support uh, basically companies, startups, entrepreneurs and investors from all over the world when expanding to Austria. I'm happy to share now with you uh, that Austria is a good place to invest in an attractive business location. Also now uh, the whole world is affected uh, of the pandemic and the global crisis, but this is no reason to stop business. As always, a crisis also offers opportunities. And I, I now would like to share my screen. Just, um, just start with a quick look on some general data. Austria is quite a small country with about 84,000 square meters uh, and 8.9 million inhabitants divided uh, into nine uh, re regions. Um, due to the corona crisis, the forecasted uh, economic growth, uh, the forecasted GDP growth is 1.3% for this year. Uh, despite also uh, despite its small size, Austria is also a wealthy country uh, with a GDP per capita of 40,500 uh, euro. It's uh, a country with a highly and highly export oriented country that exports over 55.8% uh, of all goods and services. And uh, interesting is also Austria's number two uh, regarding expenditures in research and development with an R&D quota of 3.19%. Maybe you know Austria from skiing or hiking or already have eaten the famous chocolate Asaka cake in Vienna. Uh, tourism is one part of Austria, as also Ute already mentioned uh, in her presentation. Um, but uh, there is a part which is much more important. This is the really strong economy that Austria has. 29% uh, uh, of uh, the Austrian GDP uh, is coming from uh, uh, the strong industrial sector. Um, let's have here a look on uh, the most important industry sectors. Number one is uh, machinery so, uh, with 23%. Number two is electronics so with about 10% then followed by vehicles, chemical, uh, and the food industry. What do they all have in common, especially the first four industries? Uh, they are, besides production, very R&D intense to be successful. Uh, basically, since the year 2000, Austria invested a lot in uh, innovation, high technology, and industrial research. And uh, due to this, uh, over in the period over 17 years, the expenditures increased by 66% um, um, in Austria and only by 16% um, in, uh, um, in, in the average EU countries. Foreign companies value that Austria is a research location, but also has an ideal ecosystem for the production sector. To, uh, Austrian's economy in a nutshell, it's mostly family-owned, uh, small, uh, small, medium-sized enterprises which are innovative and specialized. So this is more or less uh, the Austrian company structure. But there are also a lot of international companies uh, producing in Austria. One famous example is, I don't know if you know that every second BMW engine uh, comes from Austria, is produced in Austria, and BMW also has its competence center here. So, but let's now have a look on why Austria is a good uh, place for international companies. I'd like to highlight the following five uh, ones, which I identified in my long experience working with ABA that are really important for, for the companies. Um, this is first the central location in the heart of Europe, uh, the high stability and security. 
a good talent base, um, an innovative technology and competitive business environment, and a lot of support. So if we look on the first one, the first one for sure is uh, the market. Uh, usually companies come, um, look to find new clients, new markets, and Austria is a quite good destination due to its central location in the heart of Europe uh, with access to all important EU markets uh, and also all important hubs uh, in the surrounding markets. So in, our, in a flight time with three hours, over 720 million people can be reached. For instance, uh, if a company would like to launch a product in Austria, then can do it at a much lower uh, uh, cost, test it here and prepare it then for the rolling out in the much larger Dach region with over 100 million people. But Austria is also a very important entry door to Eastern Europe. And Austria is for this also home for over 370 regional headquarters. Many of them manage the business uh, from uh, Austria uh, into the CEE region. In the 90s, uh, we saw an inflow of mostly German companies, but since then, we saw an inflow of a lot of international companies. Um, and Austria is also regarding the competence and knowledge, has a very big competence and knowledge uh, for Eastern Europe. Second is for sure the country framework, especially in times, uh, in unstable times. Austria has a really high stability and security from all different aspects, uh, from the social aspect, the economic aspect, but also from the personal one. Just to give an example, underlining this, there are no, nearly no strikes in Austria. Uh, the social partners always try to find a consensus. Um, for instance, Austria only loses two days per thousand employees. Whereas the much uh, the, the average European rate is 49 days, though so this really makes a big difference. The corporate tax is 25%. We have a quite uh, good tax system for innovation for innovative com uh, companies with the 14% tax credit. There is no trade tax or wealth tax. Um, Austria has a lot of um, double taxation treatments with other countries and the modern group taxation system. The third reason uh, is the qualified talent. So it's uh, very important to find in a country good and qualified people. Uh, here we can offer a really a pretty um, unique system with uh, the, uh, the dual um, apprent uh, apprenticeship. Uh, that means uh, young pupils between 15 and 19 get a professional uh, education but also work in, in, uh, in, in companies. And there is also a strong focus on vocational schools that are uh, specialized um, in technical or economic uh, areas. So we have also a dense network. We already heard it from Ute uh, of universities and private and public universities. People are motivated and uh, productive and the dedication to work is, is very high in Austria. For us is uh, for sure um, the quality of life. Um, Austria ranks always on the top level in international statistics between the first uh, three countries worldwide, but offers also innovative technologies, a lot of collaboration uh, through business clusters. Clusters have a long tradition, um, collaboration between companies, uh, universities and the research uh, centers. And Austria is also the office space is um, are also really affordable. Fifth uh, point is uh, support, uh, support in terms uh, of funding. Um, I mean, public funding in terms of grants. Uh, there are programs for investments in growth for startups, for projects in research and development, for env environmental projects, as well as for internationalization uh, or exports, primarily aimed for SME companies. Those fundings are available normally on a federal level, but also on a regional level. All the region also have their own programs. And besides that national uh, measures, there is also additional financial uh, assistance through EU programs. Basically, the um, funding system in R&D is quite strong and unique. 
as uh, direct incentives are always distributed in a mix between grants and uh, subsidized loans and can be combined, as we can see here on the slide, with a 14% tax credit. That means um, companies who uh, invest in R&D can um, project-based um, get an incentive up to 60% plus uh, the tax credit. And the tax credit can be used for cost of staff and material for in-house research, but also for outsourced uh, research for external research institutes or in collaboration with universities. And uh, this system is valid for, um, for all type um, of companies. Now, during uh, the COVID-19, uh, the Austrian government also set a lot of measures for all uh, types of companies starting from the hardship fund for micro companies, financial support to ensure the liquidity, short-term work. Now we will enter in phase three of uh, short-term work. Um, the grant grants to cover fixed cost or state guarantees for loans up to 100%. And from the beginning of September, there will be also an investment premium for Austrian companies for a short period of 7%. Uh, if it's an investment uh, in digitalization, it can, goes up to 14%. So the measures uh, uh, were quite, um, quite well, very much based on, um, on, on loans and short time. A lot of companies um, um, uh, applied for the short time work. But who, who are we? Uh, what can you expect us when you, you contact us? Uh, we are owned by the Ministry of Digitalization and uh, Economics. So we are 30 experts um, located in Vienna. And we are offering consultancy service and assistance to foreign companies and startups completely free of charge. We work in all sectors and for all type of companies, uh, no matter if it's a small company or if it's a, a bigger company. Um, at the beginning, when you evaluate the country, we assist in providing all information about Austria, about uh, specific market sectors. We explain the legal and fiscal framework, as well as give information about funding sources and financing possibilities. We discuss with you where could be the right location, connect you. We have a very good network all over Austria, guide you through the subsidies, subsidized system or assist in obtaining uh, permits. And we are always happy, obviously, to, to support you. It doesn't matter which company size you have. That's from my side. Thank you very much um, for joining us today. And um, I hope we'll keep uh, in touch. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Garleitner. So uh, I will give the word to Ms. Uh, Elisabeth Campovia-Homsner from the Barcelona Chamber of Commerce. And then we can go into one or two questions regarding uh, your your area of expertise uh, for the audience. So please, uh, Ms. Campovi, it's uh, the floor is yours, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Christine. Well, my name is Elizabeth, and as I was basically presented, I'm um, leaving the department, international department in Chamber of Commerce of Barcelona. Well, I was appointed to this role this last May 2019. Lots of things have been happening since then. So our plans, our projects keeping like non-stop of changing because, you know, we need to keep updated to uh, whatever is happening around the world that nobody knows, but, but we know that everything is changing. I've just present, I've just prepared a little presentation for slides. I would like to briefly explain something and I would like to share with you what I have in mind, considering that Austria and Catalonia have lots of things in common as precise. However, I need to say that um, Mario Dubert explained a lot of things in Barcelona, so I'll try not to repeat myself. There is no time to waste, and I want the audience to be hooked to what I have prepared for them. So, well, uh, main figures I would like to tell you. Well, to start from that point, Barcelona and Catalonia figures and opportunities in a slide for some snaps, I would tell you that Financial Times sees Catalonia as the best Southern European region, and actually I agree with them. Barcelona, the city, it's the ninth urban area in the world, receiving international investment projects. So that's been 2018, now 2020, we are kind of getting double to it. Barcelona city is the first for international congresses, although this 
these what well, these last few months a lot of changes but it doesn't mean that it's not going to be like this anymore actually quite the contrary and i will tell you why the fourth global city to attract talent talent involves lots of things but we are changing in terms of starting from education to basically helping our companies as i said it's the chamber of commerce and our goal is to help our companies and i will tell you a little bit more about that in the next in the next slide Barcelona, Catalonia is the third most popular European city where to set up a startup project. Here is a lot of information. We have already mentioned it. What I would like to tell you is that uh, Chamber of Commerce of Barcelona, it's over 130 years of economic activity. We basically, it's an organization that we gather economic operators from all the sectors of any activity. Our service are for local companies, a Spanish companies, and also abroad companies uh, that basically are welcome to become you know, members of our um, association. We are representing uh, over 300,000 companies, and no, regardless the size, our goal, our goal is to make Catalonia economy stronger and stronger to face the challenging changes that are basically happening now. Who are we? Well, we are also collaborating and participating with public administrations, such as La Fira de Barcelona, which is a centenary institution. Our network right now is in, located in 50 countries, but we have already planned and ex extended that through the project that Christine mentioned, Catalunya 30 40, which is Catalonia 34. That's our goal, but because of COVID, we have moved it to Catalonia 2020. Uh, to 25 or even 30. Sectors such as subcontracting, manufacturing, food industry, smart, mobile, medical. The question is how? Well, our plan is, our main network is the international chambers around the world. That's 12,700 chambers. That gives us direct door to knock at each country. Then our goal is to work together, to work hand in hand to make things happen. As I said, we have um, our network is in 50 countries. We have already planned that in the next three years, we're gonna start working, talking to 32 different chambers where we have come down with a new memorandum of understanding, where we have a specific deadlines with specific projects such as uh, B2B in a specific year term. The reason why we have decided to do things differently is because we want to basically have different results and because we're going to compare with other regions such as Austria, we decided that to uh, basically narrow down the goals that we have in common and to work them together will help us to reach our goals faster and obviously the countries will become and economically speaking more powerful. Uh, this project, Catalonia 3040, we have the Global Hub Digital Platform, which is to provide improved operational services um, that goes in line with these 32 chambers that we are visiting, this, visiting, attending, having Zoom conversation, teams, meetings, basically. And then uh, to promote the economic development, business exchange, in the priority sectors and obviously together with trade fairs. Another project we are developing now because we want, as I said, the main goal is to improve international business opportunities for our represented companies together with other uh, regions, countries such as uh, Austria. We know that um, among small and medium enterprises, there are two main ranges that we can help them because we are very good at helping these companies. We have over 130 years of experience, and that's what prevails us for what we do. And that would be that companies whose turnover is 100,000 and want to make the big jump to 1 million, or those whose turnover is 1 million want to make the big, the big jump to 5 million, we want to help them through the process to meet their goal in a process of 12 months. This is the project we are developing together with the uh, Global Hub Digital Platforms. Um, Following this um, PPT or this uh, slide, what you can see in here are similarities, uh, exports and then the foreign direct investment, research, development, innovation, and GDP. We have no much differences. And that's why, because of the size, I honestly think we can work together. Four aspects here I want to emphasize is where we are a specialized team. 
workforce tourism business and global congresses where our strategies can work in mind. Again, I don't want to go to go over all these details because it has already been mentioned because of uh, Barcelona, gentlemen de Barcelona, and also uh, because of Austria uh, um, previous presentations. But something I would like to highlight probably is where the companies in terms of businesses there is a big um, niche for us to work to help we need to keep helping our companies and i know that's something else i'm going to tell you now is that's where we think honestly that austria can you know become a partner of us so chamber of commerce of barcelona um works uh, together with ascame ascame we call it the emeaa which is the european middle east and africa we have the secretary held basically in our building in Barcelona. So we are already working with them. Uh, so as to basically focus our main uh, efforts to not just Chamber of Commerce around the world, which is the 12,700, but also with SCAMI that represents all the Mediterranean, Africa, and Middle East, together with the Latin America companies that it's under the um, a group called ICO, as you well know. So we honestly think that uh, Austrian companies could basically be, you know, uh, take advantage of us already working with these two new institutions because we will help them to meet those or reach those goals faster. It's not just because we have the language in common, it's just because for the last 130 years we've been working together. So we do have these uh, partners, we do have these companies, we also do have these contacts, these key, key sectors that are basically are in need of welcoming companies, businesses, and likewise the other way around. That's basically all I wanted to share with you, that although it's been a year now we are working in this uh, new project of Chamber of Commerce of Barcelona, I need to tell you that the board member, where I'm actually member of as well, we are the 12th uh, businessman, and because of our background, we know for certain that in order to make things happen, you'll really need to roll your sleeves and start working. So it's been a year working hard, and although COVID-18 is here, we've been... Um, maybe as a highlight, we've been resilient to see that we need to start over again and start building up again. And that's the message that it's uh, basically for you all that together we can make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for this uh, really wonderful, inspiring and positive um, closing and um, of your presentation. So. Um, I have a, a few questions uh, we, we've collected and uh, I would um, tell them to each one of you. There are different questions for each one of you. So for Ms. Geileitner, um, the question would be an often mentioned topic in Austrian public discussion is the shortage on special skilled labor markets. How can young people entering the labor market be encouraged to choose a training in these fields? Uh, I guess I guess this goes in the direction of dual education, vocational schools, and so on. That could be also interesting for for Catalan yeah. entrepreneurs because the, especially the dual education topic is something we're actually trying to incorporate uh, in in Catalonia. I mean, um, young pupils who decide to to uh, go to a vocational school can be sure that uh, then after. Uh, finishing this school, they really get the job because these people are, are really wanted by the economies. Uh, so economy, so people who are really very well um, experienced uh, have practice-oriented, had already practice-oriented training. Uh, so and in uh, also in co in uh, combination uh, with digital skills, uh, they really have good job opportunities then. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, what makes uh, Austrian labor law special and competitive? Um, I don't know. I think we're going to hear about it's, it later, maybe on a little bit. But if you already want to give just a bit yeah, more it's a, it's information. A very, it's a very flexible law. So uh, you don't need to, to state any cause uh, when you would like to reduce your personnel. And I also think this is why the Austrian market is very, um, is very fluid. So it, there is always coming and going. Some uh, most uh, some time, but it, it's it's very flexible in respect uh, to a lot of other European countries uh, that have very rigid um, laws. Mm -hmm. 
And then for Ms. Campo V, um, there are questions about COVID. Um, how did COVID-19 affect the tourist industry in particular? Because Barcelona, of course, as we all know, is one of the ma is, is a major tourist uh, destination. Maybe um, we can connect this with another question. Uh, what strategies will Barcelona's tourists need to go back need to go back to um, to be able to go back to pre-corona levels? So, what are what are the effects in the industry, and what could be strategies that maybe are already lining out? Uh, in order to to get back um, to the pre-corona level, uh, maybe changes that are necessary uh, for the new situation. Well, there is a funny anecdote that their message is that, yeah, we do need tourism. A lot of companies based in Catalonia depend on tourism. Um, but the funny aspect, if I need to say, you know, funny, or if I could say funny, Weird. is that now the locals are trying to do the tourism in our own country. So on the one hand, it is true that we are unable to welcome external or broad tourists, but at the same time, the locals are basically spending maybe the first time ever, you know, uh, holidays now in Catalonia. The situation is tricky around the world. So it's kind of a daily basis situation where we get to see the effects right away. And it's not just that you don't need to see it today, it's just that you need to, you know, uh, foresee and start planning now for the next, let's say, after summer thing, let's say September or when Christmas comes. So uh, strategies, we are coming up with as many strategies as we can in terms of helping our companies to tackle their situation. It's not just the fact of companies being subsidized by the Spanish government, because obviously that can be forever. So seeing the evolution of COVID and hoping that vaccine eventually will come up. Meanwhile, what? So uh, unfortunately, we don't have the specific strategy, but what we know is that common sense, that's my, it's me saying it because I'm a traveler myself as well. And that would be social distance, mask, the Chamber of Commerce of Barcelona came up with the facial shields that we design ourselves so as to be, you know, literally delivering it to our companies because from now on we need to be with the social distance, facial mask and the gel, hands gel sanitizing. So for now, these are the three basics we need to do every day. As per company, you would go to Barcelona right now and this, this specifically today, you know, the city area or Barcelona area has been called in a lockdown situation. So, but I was in Barcelona last week and you would tell that everybody was literally following the rules in the sense that everybody is in need of going out, in need of meeting friends and in need of sharing that meal with, you know, that friend. So looking at the companies, whether it's um, restaurants or hotels or other companies that provide these, you know, little companies to provide their own service. So we, don't, we go on a weekly basis. I know, Christine, that I didn't answer your question properly, but that's the uncertainty all the world is living right now. So week yeah. by week, but it's non-stop uh, coming up with uh, new strategies to help our situation. Thank you. All right. Okay, so, um, well, thank you very much, uh, ladies, uh, for, the, for this uh, brief overview uh, in your areas of expertise and for our spectators and future spectators. So, um, basically, uh, we would wrap up here the second part uh, on, Catalon uh, on yeah, Catalonia and Austria. And um, before we go into a tiny pause of 30 seconds, basically, just to pass to part three, I want to um, pass uh, now the moderation to our next moderator, Ms. Linda Osuski. She is an Austrian journalist who works in Barcelona now, and she will lead the discussion with our guests uh, from the financial sector, from entrepreneur sector, and she will also help answer questions. So you know, we'll manage uh, the debate, uh, will, which will hopefully be interesting and. Um, hang in there <laughs> and we're looking forward to an interesting debate and your feedback on that so um yeah let's close here the second part and uh we'll get back to you in 30 seconds starting with the round table thank you
Hello, thank you, Christina. I welcome our viewers um, to our roundtable with the title How do companies successfully cope with, um, COVID with the COVID-19 future? Um, for which we have an excellent um, panelist here, which I will present you now. So we have Timo Bütefisch, he is CEO and co-founder of Kultra, a rental service um, for e-scooters uh, based in Barcelona and which extended to five other countries beyond. We have Beatriz Garcia Quintanilla. She's um, from the Este Group where she's director um, at the large corporate department. Then we have uh, Dennis Gloger. He's a um, tax advisor and partner of Deventer Consultancy, uh, tax, audit, tax and audit consultancy. And he's um, here as the co-founder of Medena. It's a network for German speaking young entrepreneurs based um, in Spain with about 700 members. And then we have Alejandra Navarro de Jalupa. She's a Tony at RNC Legal, which has offices in Vienna, in Madrid, and Cordoba, Argent Argentina. And uh, then we have Arnau Turu Turui Obre. He's a um, financial analyst at the Este Holding. So welcome, everybody. And I will start with um, my first uh, question. I would like to start with Timo, like um, you are here as a CEO, a company CEO, so you can tell us firsthand quickly the challenge, challenges Kultra faced during the COVID-19 uh, crisis, but especially how you cope with them and uh, what you expect for the future. Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. It's very nice to meet you. Um, as we said, I'm leading Kultra since 15 years. It's a business that I have... Um, as I founded, um, we are now uh, almost a thousand employees. We have uh, offices in, in Vienna, and uh, that's why I'm very happy to be on this uh, bridge between Vienna and Barcelona on this call. Uh, the COVID struck us uh, really hard. We have uh, two business lines. We have B2B business where we rent scooter fleets to businesses and uh, in public administration. And we have a B2C uh, business where we rent to uh, residents and tourists uh, scooters via an app and via uh, shops. Uh, just like, uh, you know, Europe Car 6, we do uh, similar business for scooters. So the, the COVID really hit us in different ways. In the, on the positive side, on the B2B side, uh, we were almost not affected because there was a high demand for delivery services during these uh, times. Uh, people were ordering uh, food and, and parcels and, and e-commerce via online and uh, we as last mile delivery service, we, we were needed to deliver these, uh, these uh, goods. No? On the B2C side, really the mobility was, uh, was completely down. In, we had a complete lockdown, as you know, in Italy and in Portugal and Spain, so we were very strongly affected. Um, how did we manage as a management team with this? We, um, we found uh, ways to, together with our employees uh, to reduce uh, uh, salaries, to reduce working hours. Uh, we took advantage of the different uh, uh, systems of ERTIS and similar systems in other countries. And we also had access to bank financing. Um, governments uh, gave via... Uh, we are um, government uh, guarantees. They um, helped local uh, banks to give credits to company like ours. So um, that was uh, basically on the on the company side. And we also involved a lot our users. Uh, we tried uh, during confinement. We tried to engage with them during other means. We we even started riddles and puzzles via our uh, app. Just to comment an anecdote, no, to have people that were confined and couldn't move, um, we involved them in other activities. Okay, thank you very much for this insight, Timo. Um, so I hear there's like a diversification as a solution that you not um, stand only on B2B, but also like B2C, but also to B2B. Um, so I would like to ask uh, Dennis, um, 
he uh, has like you have more um, you hear more voices uh, through your network. Um, are there other similar experiences like Timos and um, how do how do the entrepreneurs uh, prepare for the future? I would like to address this question to Dennis. Thank you very much, Linda. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, uh, Christina, for having us here at this platform. Well, um, regarding your question, Linda, it uh, depends very much on the sector um, the startups are based. So uh, what we experience is a very isometric uh, consequence, uh, either uh, if the company is based on an uh, in-person sector or if the company is based on an online sector. So what we experienced was that even um, there were companies that could um, increase their turnover in, in this very COVID crisis because they were like uh, software developing companies, like SEO companies, new technology companies, uh, which are like uh, the biggest part of, of the Nadena members. Um, but we also have the victims of the Corona crisis, uh, like for instance, uh, um, travel agencies or uh, event organizations or uh, event managements. Um, and so uh, Nedena as well was hit very hard by this crisis because as you can imagine, as a network, our activity is based on the face-to-face -face networking events and hosting these events. So um, yeah, we, need, we needed to, to reduce our activity 100%. What did we do um, in this situation? Well, nothing innovative, nothing new, like everybody else. We try to focus more on online. So uh, the same as this um, very situation we're living here with these interviews, we did the very same with Nedena, uh, interviewing influencers, uh, German-speaking influencers in Barcelona, or uh, at least having any relation with Barcelona, and tried to move uh, the, the in-person events on an online uh, platform. Okay, thank you, uh, Dennis. Um, I would like to ask once again, Timo, because you mentioned uh, like um, you got uh, credits um, and subvention uh, from banks uh, to survive. Can you tell us a bit more about this sure. um, uh, experience? What, what was it like? Yeah, sure. I mean, these are these famous ECOs no, that were also running through the press. Uh, uh, the basically the we we got ECOs or similar instruments in Italy and in Spain, where um, basically banks no got uh, money uh, via um, government um, institutions no guaranteed, and the banks basically uh, distribute this money to the to the companies no. But these are bank loans that you have to pay back. Huh? It's not subventions, unfortunately, and so. Uh, during the next five years, we have a heavy burden on our EBITDA because we have to pay back both principal and interest. Not easy times huh? for, for all of us because uh, for, us it's, uh, we, for us it's essential to keep all the employment um, as it is, and, uh, but the market is, is, is down, no? as you can imagine. A lot of and this, movement as, as we had before, so we have to bridge this via financing, but we have to recuperate that uh, during the next years. For us, it feels like having down, uh, burnt down the house a little bit, no? so we have to rebuild it now during the next three years. And what can you tell us between, as you are also based in Vienna and in Barcelona, can you tell us there how, how the differences between the two um, places for your business? Yeah, in Vienna, we, uh, in Austria, we only worked a B2B channel. So it was a channel which was less affected. So there we, we really didn't suffer. We have, for example, as one of our customers, it's, it's public, but it's, it's Domino's Pizza. So all the Domino's Pizza restaurants in, in Austria rent scooters from us. So they kept delivering pizza during the, during the COVID. So we weren't affected in that way. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, now I would like to turn to Alejandra, who is um, not only a lawyer, but also a consultant to the Austrian Business Agency. So you have an insight to the situation the companies are more in Austria. Um, how, how, like as you're a consultant, how can companies stay successful with the COVID-19 
crisis present and, and future. What, what strategies strategies um, do you advise uh, for the companies with this situation? Yes. First of all, thank you very much to Christina for inviting me also to participate in this uh, workshop and also for coordination of the this roundtable, Linda. Um, from the, I would like just to point out how was the situation here from the company's point of view. Uh, here in Austria, um, for sure, on the 16th of March, everything was stopped. <laughs> so uh, the companies were like all of us, we had the, the, the impression that we were sitting in the same boat. So without acknowledgement about the future and how long we have to close the company, so everybody was in the same situation. Either for the employers and employees, the same, because most of them, they start thinking maybe uh, they lose the job. But fortunately, here in Austria, uh, the government immediately act very, very fast and try to support all kind of companies in all sizes uh, with different kind of support. The problem was that uh, for many companies, like we support together with Ute in the city of Vienna and with Gerlinde, with ABA Invest in Austria, was the language. And uh, many Spanish companies, for example, established here in Austria, uh, then they needed the information and everything was like <laughs> learning by doing. So what we decided in the beginning was to prepare newsletters, to organize webinars, always in Spanish language, trying to support them to, to start to keep the, the team, to get uh, financial support from the different institutions in Austria. It took a long time because we had to say for sure it was difficult because even the banks, everyone, nobody was prepared for such a crisis. But from the other part, uh, I think that most of the company have developed new kind of business. Uh, for example, especially in digital, digital way, uh, many of them reducing their cost. This was also interesting. Even I can say from my personal point of view and our experience in the office, that sometimes, you know, the trips, for example, that you always have to do maybe once a month or every six weeks, uh, to be in different countries. Now everybody uh, really starts improving the digital uh, working style. And I think this was really a very good uh, opportunity for all of us to be more uh, active and, and, and working uh, more modern, I would say, to establish new way of, of work. And I think this is really my suggestion for all in, uh, entrepreneurs working either in Barcelona, like here in Austria, to uh, stay always with new ideas, always uh, networking, like this situation now that we have the workshops, seminars, webinars, so networking is always very important, and especially the possibility to search for support here in Austria you have really a good network of the institutions supporting you in different language and try to uh, really give you the best in order to find uh, the good capabilities in financial and with the grants and different uh, tools. Thank you, Alejandra, uh, for this insight and for the advice you gave. <laughs> Um, now we had the company's business perspective, um, but we also have uh, financial specialists here, experts um, for um, finances. Beatrice and Arnau, what, what can COVID-19, um, what can you tell us about the crisis from a bank's perspective and what, what has changed actually um, during this pandemic in, in your side of the job? Uh, thank you, Linda, for giving us the floor. Uh, well, as uh, Alejandra said, this is a pleasure to have been invited to this event. Uh, so thank you for, for organizing the panel. Um, well, uh, I can tell you that these are very busy times for the banks because all the companies are, that have been affected by COVID, which are the majority of the companies, uh, are applying for um, uh, state guaranteed uh, loans and other support measures. Mm, let's say that uh, it's not an easy, 
it's not an easy moment uh, for the bank because even if it means that there is more business involved and uh, more loans and more revenues, it also implies that there is a higher risk of impairment. So the philosophy of the bank is always support their clients. Well, I think all, of all the banks, eh? always support their clients to, in order to help them eh, maintain the employment in the region and also to, to sustain the, the economy. Um, as long as they are existing clients and as long as they were in good shape before the COVID crisis. For companies that weren't in good shape before the crisis and now are even in worse, uh, in, our, in our situation, um, I think the, the banks are more reluctant to, to give them support. Um, I think uh, also that the, the Austrian government has reacted very fast to the, to the situation, uh, setting up a line of 38 billion euros uh, in different kind of aids for the SMEs and large corporates and also for entrepreneurs and uh, micro companies. There are uh, different products uh, depending on the needs of, uh, of the companies. And uh, these funds have been successful. Um, as, as I told you, banks are very busy uh, helping the, their clients. And well, um, as, um, as a reflection, um, I think the banks are, and the government are, are able to support uh, the, the, the temporary situation uh, created by COVID that has lasted more or less in Austria one or two months. But it is very important that there is not a second wave because if there is a second lockdown, the economy is going to, to take a very great effort in order to recover. And there are a lot of businesses that I think wouldn't survive. So we have to all act responsibly and try to, to keep the virus uh, under control. So <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask, um, you mentioned that uh, you check your um, existing clients and um, also if they were in good health already. So um, you have now this um, um, line, this eco line where the state comes and um, gives the guarantee. Does it change um, a bit uh, in how you grant the, the credit? Does it um, also include companies that uh, maybe uh, without a guarantee wouldn't get, uh, would not well, be the, granted. The, I, I'm, talking, I'm talking about the Austrian bank and the Austrian government because we are here now sitting in Vienna. And well, I can also give you a little bit of um, insight on how the banks think in general, also in Spain. So the point here is that if you are granting a, a client a, a loan, even if it's uh, state guaranteed, there is a part of the loan that is not covered by this guarantee because the guarantees are never 100% are maximum. In Spain, they are 70% of the loan amount. And here in Austria, they can reach 90% uh, in some cases, but the average I think is 70, 80%. Uh, so if the, if the client was not in good shape, uh, you cannot prove in the first place, the government might not accept their request for the, the financing because the, the clients always have to go to the government or to the different agencies of the government that are uh, channeling these aids in order to get the approval. And then they go to the banks and say, okay, I have this, uh, I need the financing. Or this, this, this process can also run in parallel, but it's, a, it's always, it, 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 the client always must count on the approval of the of the governmental agency. Uh, they have to prove that the COVID has impacted them in a negative way and that and therefore they have less income or uh, that is affect, affected their liquidity and that therefore they need more working, capi working capital facilities, et cetera, et cetera. Otherwise, if um, they need the money because they were already uh, in financial trouble, the government is not going to approve their request and their, then the bank shouldn't support the, the aid request because it's not COVID related, it's, uh, it has other, other grounds. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then is, I would like to come back to you um, because there's um, like we have young entrepreneurs that um, 
maybe just started uh, a few months before um, before the COVID crisis. Um, I mean, how do they struggle with this situation? And what can you tell us also about um, like freelancers that you um, also said that they are they are uh, in big difficulties and um, That's what I wanted to know from your, because you have your net network, so you have an insight to, to these people. Yeah, well, we have an insight, but uh, we don't get feedback from everybody. So um, it's in general, obviously, if you just started your activity and the corona crisis hits you, uh, it might hurt you more than if you have a, a business running for a long time, having the... the proper uh let's say safety belt put on uh for freelancers the case was that maybe the economic support from from the government was not enough uh or relatively spoken because um the government said you will get a uh, amount of money based on what your amount is that you pay to social security and everybody uh well most of the new freelancers uh the ones that just start a business obviously choose the cheapest way to start a business which is to pay the less possible of social security quota so now they found themselves that obviously if they were just paying The, the littlest uh, amount of social, the money they got back from the government was not enough to pay even the rent. So um, there was a big um, uh, issue within the freelancer uh, lobby groups, within the freelancer organization saying that the money that they received was not enough. But I can also understand the country that has not enough money to give support to everybody will first of all look to the sectors where most employees are and most people that are working, and these are the companies. So there is obviously a trade-off if you have not enough money as a government. So no critics from this part. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Um, I would like to ask you all um, another thing, another question, like the COVID crisis um, has raised fundamental questions about our society, our lifestyle, our global economic system. Um, Alejandra already mentioned it, uh, like reducing trips uh, was suddenly an option uh, and for enforcing more the digital work style. Um, and also topics like sustainability, social entrepreneurship are getting more attention these days. Um, I would like to ask you all, um, what changes do you think we need in our society in a post-COVID-19 future? So I don't know who wants to start. <laughs> Just go ahead. Yeah, well, I can start, <laughs> if you allow me. Uh, of course. <laughs> well, uh, in terms of... Um, financial uh, sustainability of the of the companies i think um, the companies should uh, focus on the on the things that make them unique and differentiate mm -hmm. them from the competitors and try to to cost cut on the things that are not maybe essential yeah. uh, just, just in order to to pass the these difficult years that are coming ahead And also to have uh, to think positively and also develop new new ways of of making business because uh, yeah everything is changing and we don't know how much so I think um, the creativeness as, as Alejandra mentioned before is super important uh, in the post COVID uh, so what, what, society. What kind, of, what, what kind of changes do you think um, when you say like do you have some best practice? Um, examples from your clients maybe? Well with my clients it's difficult because they are very big yeah. <laughs> and uh, some of them cannot be so flexible uh, in terms of changing their business strategy. They are huge companies and they are very much international and most, most of them are uh, machinery related but for, a, for a, a smaller companies um, I think going more digital is, uh, yeah. is important 
and also focusing on the future needs after COVID, no? So maybe um, there won't be so much physical traveling, there will be more, yeah, uh, IT meetings. So everything related to IT, I think it, they have a, a good chance there. And also in safety, no? Um, everything that is uh, health related will also have a boost and yeah, the um, hospitality business and industry, they also will have to, to develop new, new ways of selling uh, food or accommodation and make people feel comfortable uh, yeah. using their services. Mm -hmm. But it's just uh, ideas, no? So the companies have to become more efficient uh, in order to survive and also to, in order to, to sustain their um, revenue base, they have to be creative and try to, to find revenues in different ways. Thank you it's very not, much. Not, nothing very... <laughs> <laughs> no, we can ask Timo, he, he's like a uh, like, uh, CEO, so maybe he can tell us how he is seeing this question, what, what changes our society need um, in a post-COVID mm -hmm present and future and also yes. to, to run yeah. the company. I, I, I can maybe talk about a little bit about what is happening in our company or what we are seeing in our sector is um, we definitely need a lot of flexibility you know, in terms of um, yeah. employees and uh, also understanding of shareholders. Um, we are adapting, trying to adapt quickly. As example, in Kultur, we We now launched uh, also shared bicycles. We before only had um, motors, and now we also launched uh, electric bicycles. In general, we, we are trying to take advantage of the positive aspects no, of the whole uh, new situation. People are now more, uh, more uh, um, concerned about sustainability. They are more concerned about moving individually through the cities. Um, cars are disappearing from the inner cities. Um, people definitely move less, no? So um, the, the, when they move, they want to move in a very efficient way. I think the ownership of vehicles will disappear um, more and more. People have no need to own a vehicle. And then there's a whole topic of digitalization, no? That the, the cities are um, introducing sensors in, in their city systems, um, a, a, where we had before um, a metro or bus tickets, which were physical, we will have mobility passes that people can, for a flat rate during a, a month, can use different means of transport. So there's a lot of opportunities in each sector. I was not talking only about mobility, but uh, I guess in, in any sector there's uh, happening so much. I mean, I think education, for example, I would see it's a sector that has been growing in the last uh, few months especially online education, for example. No? So I think there's plenty of opportunities. People know that they have to be better prepared and, and online education is now such an, such an interesting thing and it's so scalable, even across boundaries. So I think there's also a lot of opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think I would like to add something as well. Um, I think that one of the points is uh, efficiency, Uh, so to reduce the unnecessary costs, like uh, Beatrice very well uh, indicated before. But there are two points that I think that they are really decisive at the moment. And this is uh, that the client, the customers, no normally appreciate when you offer something which is tailor-made. So now this crisis show us that the customer uh, really stays with you when you offer the best service and you give them the feeling that they are not just a number, that they are really, that uh, they appreciate your efforts when you support them in such a crisis. Uh, this is the first, the approach, this personal conversation, even a digital way, I think is really very, very important. I, From my point of view, it will remain and it will be excellent if it, it remains uh, as part of our daily work. And another point that I think is also very important is the employees. Uh, this uh, fidelization of your employees, that you invest on them and support them and motivate them. Because in the crisis, the most important capital that a company has are the employees. 
you know, the people that you have uh, really um, trained during years, maybe. Yeah, and then just because this crisis, it doesn't mean that you had to <laughs> finish with all of them or big part of them, because when the situation became better, then what are you going to do? Yeah. This was, at least in our advice, always uh, the conversation with the companies. And the motivation is the most important part, really the biggest capital, I would say, of the company. Okay, thank you very much for the input. So, um, yeah, I, if anyone, I don't know, Dennis, do you want to tell us something about what's your perspective on, on this topic? Like what well, the changes are needed in the society for uh, a future in the post COVID, like post COVID nineteen future. Well, I think um, pretty much everything was was said already. Uh, maybe in the in the business um, sector, I would like to add that obviously the tolerance for um, working from home has changed and and will change, as we already said. Um, Zoom and, and online interviews and, and also with clients will be more regular, I think, but also the, the working from home will be more regular. And, and what I think is important is that we um, realize that it's not working only from home, but that the companies and employees adapt to new situation, giving the infrastructure to properly work from home and as an employee, to know how to handle a situation which is completely different from working in an office. Just two examples or one example. Uh, for a company, it's, it's important to, to have all the, the data protection, the legal infrastructure ready for somebody working from home. And for the employee, it's important to not be isolated or, mm -hmm. or not be distracted by, by children, by family, by, by the pet or whatever. So I think we are in a good way to improve, in general, the home-based, the online services, the online work, etc. But uh, not only because you work from home, it is home working. Yeah. So I think there is um, yes. a lot of, of things to still to improve. But okay, it was from, from today till tomorrow or from yesterday to today. So um, we have some time to, to, to implement um, all this stuff. But I think that's important to realize. Thank you, Dennis. Um, yeah, I will come to an end. Also, there would be uh, some more questions. Uh, there's also with uh, working from home, the question of the work-life balance. Um, there are studies that show that you work much more <laughs> when you are at home. So there's always um, pros and cons in, in um, both uh, strategies how to work. Um, but our time is finishing, so I want to thank you very much to the panelists um, for the uh, very interesting inputs. And uh, I pass the word um, to Christina. Yes, um, thank you very much, Linda. Thank, uh, thanks, a big thanks to all of you for participating and for your patience and for your really interesting input uh, as well. A big thank you to our speakers before from an institutional point of view, the services uh, that are available, available for people who want to uh, build a business, who want to invest in our business locations. And a big thank you to the last panelists uh, for giving insights from their um, point of view, um, daily business, so to say. Um, I think that's all valuable information and to make sure that this valuable information uh, can be on the internet. We will later on do our best to upload uh, the video so it will be available to more people who might be interested. And we also hope to continue this conversation because uh, what has been clear today that there there is a lot of um, things happening, not only in, in range of COVID, but also seeing as a chance or changes that are taking place and that we'll have to face uh, yes or yes. And uh, as we could kind of filter out of the different comments, especially in the last, in the last uh, part uh, of this event, uh, innovation, flexibility, motivation, also of employees, I thought it was a very interesting point. Also looking at uh, establishing the right frameworks uh, for this new situation, if working from home, whatever, going to more sustainability in, in, in altogether. 
um, there is a lot of room to discuss. And so we're actually looking forward to continue. But I think that uh, especially for today, it was a very rich uh, input and very diverse input as well. And uh, not only from different uh, places internationally seeing, but also uh, from different sectors. And at the same time, as Linda also said before, and I think some other panelists pointed it out, uh, we have lots of things in common. And this is actually uh, our idea to, to work together because only together we can face this crisis successfully. And the best practice exchange is one of the most important uh, elements uh, that can help us, especially since Catalonia and Austria have very similar uh, ground, working ground, so to say. Um, so thanks again to all of you. Also, thanks to the audience. And uh, well, um, I can only say uh, goodbye and uh, hopefully see you soon. Have a successful week. So take care, adeo and servus. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.